Thank you. Uh, hello, commissioners. My name is Allison Ro Dr. Allison Rose Jefferson. We'll go with that today. Uh, I'm a, a, a historian and a public, uh, a public historian and a uh, heritage conservation consultant. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, the African American experience, uh, uh, historical experience with um, beach culture here in Los Angeles County, and I'm going to uh, some people will want me to say more than I'm going to say, but I only have 25 minutes, and so uh, I will be glad to talk to folks uh, outside of this presentation, and uh, also uh, there are some resources I could uh, maybe direct you to for future uh, study. Uh, African Americans began moving in large numbers to, Los to the Los Angeles environs in the decades surrounding the turn of the 20th century, joining uh, communities of whites and Jews and Chinese and Japanese and old Californios and new Mexican immigrants, um, as well as immigrants of other uh, national backgrounds. The majority of, the majority of new uh, black migrants relocated from American southern states. Like those who moved to uh, northeastern parts of the U.S., African Americans moving to California and other western parts also acted to escape the worst of Jim Crow era racial restrictions. African Americans, similar to others who moved to the state, embraced the booster, promoted California dream of a leisure lifestyle in picturesque outdoor settings and new life opportunities, even while discrimination, lax enforcement of Cal and lax enforcement of California's civil rights laws for decades in the 20th century prevented them uh, from using various public or private facilities and buying land in many areas. Today, I'm going to share. Uh, some brief remarks about a few stories covered uh, in my forthcoming book titled Living the California Dream, African American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era with the University of Nebraska Press, um, primarily about uh, Santa Monica Bay's Bruce's Beach and the Ocean um, Park Beach, sometimes called the Inkwell, that were enjoyed by African Americans during this era. These and other sites became contested ground in the development of attractive beaches and resorts relatively free from white citizens' harassment. In Los Angeles, leisure presented a distinctive political concern in the nation's long freedom rights struggle and civil rights movement. Today, I'm also going to share some ways that um, I've helped organizations begin to use these stories to engage audiences in heritage as well as nature conservation and environmental justice education intersecting with beach recreation. And some of these ideas are things that you all may think about for future uh, implementation suggestions um, uh, as you uh, do your work. In Manhattan Beach, the first place I'm going to discuss the recovery and struggle to present the fuller Bruce's Beach story for the public shows the difficult steps towards a more complex, accurate, and multiple meaningful public memory, which hopefully encourages the formation of a more inclusive sense of a collective identity and basis for future public policy. <clears throat> In 1912, Woola and Charles Bruce purchased uh, Manhattan Beach land to build a resort near uh, the Pacific Ocean shoreline between 26th and 27th Streets west of Highland Avenue. Their business and the surrounding small oceanfront African American residential community which developed eventually became known as Bruce's Beach. 
enabled by public transportation, Manhattan Beach was one of the last cities to, be, to begin development along the South Santa Monica Bay coastline. In this time period, people from uh, Los Angeles and Pasadena could take the electric streetcar and arrive in a little more than an hour at this oceanfront retreat. Most of the area's um, growth occurred after World War II with the aircraft industry springing up and population growth in uh, the Los Angeles environs and freeways making the coastal cities desirable and accessible for commuters. In 2013, uh, or rather today, Manhattan Beach, uh, Manhattan Beach's barren uh, sand dunes of yesteryears uh, have evolved into a prosperous, overwhelmingly white enclave with a prestigious address where aging baby boomers build wood and mortar dream ho homes on the sand. The Bruce Resort accommodated the enjoyment needs of African-American day trippers and overnight guests in, um, in, and, and in time they were featuring, uh, uh, in time they had space for dining and dancing and a few rooms for uh, overnight paying uh, guests to stay, a bathhouse and space for outdoor recreation. Upon the small resort's opening, some local white landowners took action with the invocation of public power and private actions to harass and contest the leisure of the Bruce's patrons. Mrs. Bruce became somewhat of a cause celeb as she was an irritant, uh, irritation source to the local white supremacists. The pioneering Mrs. Bruce declared to the Los Angeles Times she was prepared to fight to keep her property and business. The resort was a popular year-round and seaside gathering place and a financially successful enterprise for its owners. It drew Afro-Angelinos Afro to one of the few places locally where they could relatively comfortably enjoy the Pacific Coastline offerings. By the early 1920s, there was an uptick in harassment of the African-American pioneers with some concerned and increasingly vocal white citizens um, having the belief that there was a Negro invasion in progress, which would have an adverse effect on property values. When white supremacist harassment tactics, including police harassment and threats from the local Ku Klux, Ku Klux, Klan's, Ku Klux Klan group did not succeed in scaring African Americans away, a proposal to condemn the Manhattan Beach uh, northern neighborhood through eminent domain to create a park was submitted by private citizens to the city council and was eventually passed in 1924. All after challenges, challenges to these proceedings were unsuccessful, the evicted Bruce's Beach African American community property owners settled for the most favorable sale prices they could obtain. Whether they were adequately compensated for their land has remained open to debate into the 21st century. The Bruce's Beach community and its visitors were not alone in facing legal sanctions and private harassment actions during, uh, uh, private harassment actions discouraging African Americans from visiting and settling in particular beach locations as the region's population increased uh, uh, during the 1920s. During this decade, Several Save the Beach campaigns were implemented to keep African Americans from creating and maintaining beachfront resorts. Similar cases to exclude African Americans occurred <clears throat> at, other Southland, um, at other Southern California beach towns in the 1920s. A few miles south of Santa Monica's Ocean Park neighborhood and north of Bruce's Beach around the area of the airport in El Segundo, in 1925, African Americans were forced to give up a development of a beachfront resort. 
numerous white-run civic and business groups, including some in the Santa Monica Bay, supported the action against the uh, proposed El Segundo uh, Beach Resort Plan. Other resort, <coughs> other beach resorts suffered similar fates. The most violent intimidation campaign to evict African Americans from enjoying the beach was the, the destruction of the nearly completed Pacific Beach Club in Huntington Beach. Arsonists burned the beautiful new facility to the ground shortly before it was to open in 1926. There were also exclusionary actions which occurred in Santa Monica, which I will discuss a little later. There were confrontations and assaults across decades, some of which turned violent, aimed to bar African Americans from public beaches. Activists mounted legal challenges to these discriminatory um, practices uh, uh, endeavored by whites. One example of this was in 1920, Arthur Valentine, uh, while with his family, was shot by off-duty sheriffs when he refused to leave the public beach near Topanga Canyon that they said was private beach. Even with such white violence and attempts to evict African Americans from public beach space at various places along the uh, Southern California coast, these communities delay, uh, the, uh, this community's uh, days of recreation and leisure occurred unabated. African Americans were discreetly publicly mindful in their oceanfront visits, but undeterred by attempts to harass, molest, intimidate, or restrict them from Southern California public beaches. In their first organized civil disobedience action in the region, members of the Los Angeles branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1927 challenged Manhattan Beach officials when they tried additional measures to make the beach white only. Although the Bruce's uh, beach community was raised, after NAACP members staged a swim-in protest and legal maneuvers, clarification was one that African Americans had the legal right to enjoy this and all California beaches. Go back. Go forward, go forward. Yeah, thank you. In the coming decades, um, this accomplishment of the NAACP uh, contributed to racial restriction attempts at public beaches fading away. The Afro Angelinos were energized by this victory um, at this time, the NAACP's national office proclaimed in a press release, this militant stance for civil rights in Southern California set a good backdrop for their 19th convention that would be held in Los Angeles in 1928. As the 20th century advanced, African Americans around the U.S. would increasingly utilize legal actions and public protests to dismantle legally sanctioned along with informally enforced discrimination and segregation in public accommodations. Eventually, in 1956, out of fear of legal consequences of past inaction by the local Manhattan Beach officials, the vacant terrain once enjoyed by African Americans was transformed into a park. After various waves of local citizens' sometimes contentious public discussion about their municipality's heritage over many years, in, 1920, in, in 2007, the site not officially known as Bruce's Beach was formally commemorated with a park named in its honor and a descriptive text with gross inaccuracies by Manhattan Beach city leaders 80 years after the black resort community was removed. 
The public commemoration opened up broader claims for public memory and American identity, even with the sinus text that dilutes, misrepresents, and partially omits the site's historical truth and understanding. The site has continued to hold a contentious place in the Manhattan Beaches, uh, in Manhattan Beaches community's heritage, civic identity, and collective consciousness. African Americans were able to build a sustained community in the city of Santa Monica, founded in the 1880s. A few uh, founded in the 1880s. This community was a few blocks from the Pacific shoreline in the environs of what is today the Civic Center, which we had some conversation at this meeting about uh, uh, a couple of days ago uh, to do with a permit for a park. Um, and, uh, and near there was also Phillips Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, the first African-American uh, church established in Santa Monica. Um, <clears throat> it's a short, and then a short way uh, uh, south was the Venice neighborhood, which you all have become a little familiar with, which was also part of uh, the Santa Monica African-American community. Um, could you go back one? Back, you're going forward, okay. So you can see where the church is and the Civic Center is just to the, um, on my left of where Phillips Chapel is mentioned there. <clears throat> In the years surrounding Phillips Chapel's uh, beginnings in 1908 at 4th and Bay Streets, the oceanfront area down the hill around Pico, south a few blocks to Bicknell Street, emerged as a gathering place where African Americans from all over Los Angeles County came to enjoy the beach's pleasures. While the boundaries shifted through time, it's, it was a popular beach destination for African Americans from 1900 to the 1960s. Many of the beachgoers once uh, referred to this stretch um, of the coastline as the Bay Street Beach. Others called it the inkwell. The latter term was most certainly derogatory and first used by whites referring to the skin color of the beachgoers. Some African Americans reclaimed the term and used it as a badge of pride. Some who went to the beach never used the term. In contemporary times, there are people who still would prefer the term not be used. Phillips Chapel and the families and extended clans of the Stouts, the Lawsons, the McCarrolls, the Brunsons, the Reeses, the Tabers, the Gordons, the Maxwells, and others from the Santa Monica uh, uh, community uh, that played an, imp uh, played an important role in drawing African Americans from across the Southland region and beyond for leisure at the beach. Accessibility by streetcar near a thriving African American community centered around Phillips Chapel and a few black owned businesses. This beach gathering place with a bathhouse, eating places, tennis courts, volleyball nets, and other recreational opportunities became a place of refuge and community formation. In 1922, a group of African American investors led by prominent attorney Charles S. Darden and businessman Norman O. Houston, who would go on to become a founder of uh, the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company and other businesses sought to develop a first-class resort along the beach at Pico Boulevard. The plan was met with uh, protest from white citizens and businessmen and the Santa Monica City Council officially, uh, uh, Santa Monica City Council officials blocked the development from happening. After the black investment group ab abandoned its plans, the property was purchased by white developers. 
The white group's plans for resorts were approved, and the iconic Casa del Mar Hotel, uh, the iconic Casa del Mar Club, now uh, a hotel, and another club, the Edgewater, uh, now uh, uh, the hotel Shutters on the Beach, were built before 1930. No, no. Even with this and other uh, development, African Americans kept their hold on the public beach space, although they were pushed further south. They were able to avoid overtly physical, hostile discrimination as the area evolved from the edge to the center of public activity. While racial discrimination in, in particular uh, racial, uh, in particular, restrictive covenants prevented African Americans from buying property throughout the urban region. Their community's presence and agency sustained their public use at the oceanfront in Santa Monica. This and other Southland leisure spaces marked an African-American identity on the regional landscape and social space as they confronted the emergent power politics of leisure and set the stage for these sites as places of remembrance of invention and public contest. This image that's here on the screen now is also on one of the poster boards in the back if you want to take a look at it. And some of the other images that were in the presentation are also around, um, uh, on, in the slideshow, are also around the room. The city of Santa Monica's 2005 landmark designation of Phillips Chapel CME Church set the stage in 2008 for the official recognition with a landmark monument at Bay Street and Oceanfront Walk of the historical African-American beach gathering place, sometimes called the Inkwell, and Nick Gabaldon, uh, the first documented surfer of African-American and Mexican-American descent in the Santa Monica Bay. Gabaldon's and other African-Americans' actions to use this and other beaches embody the local stories that contribute to the national narrative of mass movement to open leisure spaces to all, demonstrating how the struggle for leisure and public space along with political and economic issues reshaped the long civil rights movement. At leisure and recreation spaces, despite the systematized white racism uh, in ethnically diverse Los Angeles, which uh, was most consistently targeted at African Americans, they proved that racism of the region was more readily contestable than elsewhere in the country. At Bay Street, the, the kind of designation that uh, was put in infuses a cultural and natural resource site with complexities of human history and experiences offering a critical dimension beyond beauty, rarity, environmental, and environmental protection, which strengthens both the heritage and nature conservation movement's objectives. From an environmental justice viewpoint, the inclusion of the history is symbolic of limited social change. Landmarking of this uh, site pushes forth a sense of collective uh, cultural belonging and common membership in American society that helps in forming the basis for social progress and action in the future. As a public historian, I have led coordination to facilitate remembrance of African American voices in Santa Monica historic sites through the development of innovative programming partnerships uh, between the Santa Monica Conservancy, Heal the Bay, uh, the Black Surfers Collective, Surf Academy, LA County Supervisors, the California Historical Society, uh, and others.
the benefit of ongoing investment in pluralistic heritage and nature education through partnerships is important to continue building future pathways to new, wider, and younger audiences, as well as established audiences in support of heritage, uh, in support of the heritage and nature conservation movements. This programming, uh, such as Nick Gabaldon Day, International Coastal Cleanup Day, uh, field trips for youngsters, uh, and other public education action uh, programs like this one today and some of the other things that I mentioned earlier, um, actively connect diverse publics to more complex culturally inclusive stories of our collective national history, social action, beach access issues, ocean life and, wa ocean life and uh, watershed stewardship, interacting with beach recreation. The nature conservation movement's engagement of broader and more culturally inclusive audiences is enhanced by developing the cultural and historical heritage of natural sites, such as the ones I discussed today, to reach specific audiences and align with community values. Supporters of both heritage and nature conservation objectives must include the language of injustice, discrimination, inequity, and racism in discussions to acknowledge the continuing struggle to totally dismantle these conditions, which in more places than some may want to recognize, continue inhibiting uh, communities of color from full civic participation, human experiences, and civic and, and civil si uh, society entitlements. As the California Coastal Commission is moving forward on its environmental justice policies with the inclusion of this language and the recognition of this history and current uh, conditions of disenfranchised communities. This policy is an important new operational step towards a more fully realized vision of coastal protection and access for all people to enjoy the state's coastline. The public commemoration of the Santa Monica Bay uh, historical African American beach sites I've discussed today open the door towards environmental justice by uh, recognizing that communities of color have a right to historical and cultural sites along with clean air and water and enjoyment of America's natural resources. Public process activities for education, stewardship action, remembrance of our collective history and cultural identity offer new ways to connect people with nature, cultural, and historical heritage, and encourage visitation to, the lo uh, to various locations, including the ones that I highlighted today. The commission needs to firmly engage in encouraging these broader educational programs for wider equity and access for all people to the California coastline now and in the future. Thank you. Thank you. So if I, I understood that you all might have questions. Um, uh, I, are there I don't some know. questions? Or comments uh, that I, you want me to respond to? If not, I'll sit down. Okay. <laughs> Uh, C uh, Commissioner Turnbull Sanders. Well, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think this is so important and so historic that we're taking the time to learn. Um, uh, I only recently learned um, the significance of, of the word Yom Kippur <laughs> last September. I looked it up um, and, um, and really appreciate the significance of reparation, of repair. 
I mean, it's the holiest day in, the, uh, in Judaism, and it's about reparation. It's about repairing what's been broken. And, and today, in having you here, I, I feel so nourished um, because it's, it's a very important um, uh, you know, thing to, to hear these untold stories. Um, and, um, and that helps in the healing of what's been broken, of us being disconnected from one another, um, of whole communities, right, being ignored, um, and, uh, and the loss that it is to all of us. Um, not to know <laughs> um, and and be touched um, uh, by um, the full facts and the full truth. Um, so thank you for your work, for your leadership, um, and for your presentation today. Uh, 2019 also marks uh, 400 years since the first slave ship um, came ashore on the East Coast. So. Um, African Americans are very much native, they're native at this point <laughs> to this country. I mean, certainly, you know, um, not uh, in place of indigenous Native Americans, but I mean, 400 years, right? Um, and, uh, and so, um, you know, it's always bittersweet and when we come to moments like this, because on the one hand, there is so much to celebrate and to honor and to recognize that we're taking these significant steps um, and to feel good about that and to honor that and um, that it's taken 400 years to get here <laughs> uh, that you know it's just today that you know like these stories are coming out right are, are being shared with a broader audience um, we've got a long way to go we've got much more um, reparation work to do um, and and it comes in so many ways and this is one of those ways um, where the reparation you know it's taking place and so uh, just want to thank thank you for being part of that and um, thank you to to staff and, and the commission for for including this Commissioner Sanders thank you chair Bochco um, dr. Jefferson I just would like to wholeheartedly thank you for taking time to really put these issues in context and for your continued dedication to the community you truly are a treasure in our community um, to be able to bring this to the state of California and recognize the history so that we address these issues and we don't repeat it and that we look at these structural challenges the historic challenges the grounding in place in history um, the strength and power of that so that we understand that collectively we have to move beyond this history and address it um, in ways that um, enable all of Californians to participate um, fully in uh, coastal um, enjoyment, recreational opportunities. But very much thank you for doing this. And I know just a, a little plug for Nick Gavaldon Day. Um, Dr. Jefferson is always out there um, at the uh, Bay Street Inkwell site on Nick Gavaldon Day and also is a um, constant supporter of the coastal cleanup days and she's out there doing that work as well so thank you again thank you and i do hope that you know you think about these stories that i discussed here today in your work as you move forward um, there's more to these stories i just gave you you know a brief brush outline of two of the more recognized sites, but the fact that the site in Orange County, uh, the Pacific Beach Club was burned to the ground, all of these things tell you why there are not African Americans, why there are not very many other communities of color living at the beach because of the uh, historical harassment that occurred. and so reparations, as uh, Commissioner Morales offered uh, in her comments, is uh, uh, certainly important in whatever ways that we can offer um, those kinds of things for equal uh, access to all our citizens to the California coastline. Commissioner Webno has a question. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Bochco, and just want to echo the comments of my colleagues um, in thanking uh, Dr. Jefferson for that wonderful presentation. I have a quick question because you mentioned um, the, the um, 
plaque or the memorial um, at Bruce's Beach in Manhattan. And if I understood you correctly, the wording on that sounds like it was at some point inaccurate or misleading maybe even. Um, is that yes. still the case today? Yes. It is, okay. Yes. And is, are there attempts being made to rectify that or? Well, um, it's in the air. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the city council uh, implemented that language uh, in 2007, 2008. It was, uh, dedicated at that time and I haven't tried to do anything since then. I've been in graduate school and what have you and so I'm getting reorganized for the next phase and um, so hopefully at some point uh, there will be some opportunities to um, maybe get that text uh, reworked. Uh, so there's some there's work to be done, I guess. There's work to be done. So I, I just want to highlight that, and also. Um, and even in Santa Monica, <coughs> some things could be done around the monument site sure. in Santa Monica. Well, right, as and we well. talked about that in the context of the the permit application that came before us yeah. the other day for the bike path expansion. And I would just um, ask staff to um, consider that as we go forward with any um, similar permit requests in Manhattan or anywhere else, frankly, where. Um, these monuments exist and there may be either language that could be improved or we could highlight it more efficiently with signage or whatever it is because I'd love to see that as part of those requests. Thanks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It was really a lovely presentation and very meaningful. All right, we're going to take a little bit of a break so everybody can get reorganized. So let's be back here in quarter of. <laughs>